let me introduce you to our first speaker today, Hod Lipson. Hod is a roboticist who works in the areas of artificial intelligence and digital manufacturing. He and his students love designing and building robots that do what you least expect robots to do. Self-replicate, self-reflect, ask questions, and even be creative. Hod's research asks questions such as, can robots ultimately design and make other robots? Can machines be curious and creative? Will robots ever truly be self-aware? To provide answers to some of these questions, it's my pleasure to welcome Hod to the virtual stage. Welcome, Hod. Thank you. So I want to talk today about artificial intelligence. Now, it's a topic that uh, you hear a lot about, uh, that people are interested in lots of different ways. In fact, I would say that companies are almost panicking trying to understand how artificial intelligence affects their business and their market. Uh, it's everywhere. But uh, you hear a lot of examples of how people use artificial intelligence, but not necessarily uh, why it's moving forward so quickly. And what I want to do today is give you insight into what is driving artificial intelligence. Why is it moving forward so quickly? Uh, some of the things I'll, I'll say you might know, but, but I'll give you some insights in, into behind the scenes drivers of this technology that you might not know. Uh, and hopefully that uh, these drivers will help you understand a little bit uh, where this technology is going to go into the future. So uh, let me uh, just uh, first start by saying that the challenge talking about artificial intelligence that I've faced over the years is that while in Hollywood, artificial intelligence uh, always takes the form of you know, robots and flashing lights and all kinds of crazy things, in reality, artificial intelligence is transparent. You don't see it. You can't smell it. You can't touch it. It's like air. It is everywhere but you can't feel it. It permeates almost everything that we do, and yet you cannot feel it. And this is, you walk down the street, you don't see artificial intelligence, you don't see robots, you don't see blinking lights, nothing. And yet it permeates everything we do from the stock market to predicting the weather, to predicting what song you're gonna listen to next, what, click, what link you're gonna click on, what product you're gonna buy. It's even grading essays, I mean, you name it, it is, affecting everything from job prospects to pension plans, and yet you don't see it. So, so what is driving this? Why is AI moving forward so quickly? Uh, and what has changed? Uh, is it just business as usual or is something different happening? So I want to give you a little bit of insight into what is driving this technology and why it's moving forward so quickly. And I want to start with, with uh, uh, the obvious uh, idea uh, and that is that uh, it's all based on exponential technologies. Now, what are exponential technologies? Exponential technologies are those that accelerate with time. But when we say excel, uh, when when I say exponential, I don't mean that in a in a figurative uh, way, meaning just getting faster over time. I mean that actually in mathematically exponential. So, what does that mean? Something that's mathematically exponential means it doubles at a regular frequency at a regular pace so it has a doubling time every so many months it will double so for example if you look at uh, the first driver artificial intelligence that is simply computing power or what we call price performance of computing power and that has been doubling uh, every 20 months or so for the past almost 120 years 120 years of computing technology from mechanical instruments all the way to GPUs today have been doubling the price performance ratio uh, almost every 20 months. It's an incredible uh, performance rate uh, and uh, that uh, is underlies a lot of the things that we see in information technology. Now, you might say, okay, well, I knew that. That's called Moore's Law. And we, we're familiar with the fact that uh, computers are getting faster, cheaper, and better. And uh, a lot of people stop there and they say, okay, I understand artificial intelligence is software technology after all. And it is rides the curve of computing power. And if computing power doubles every 20 months, so does AI. Well, the truth is that's a small piece of the puzzle. So let me tell you what else is happening in artificial intelligence 
that's moving it fa uh, faster and faster, accelerating it at an exponential rate beyond just computing power. And to understand that next thing that is happening, we have to talk a little bit about how AI works. Now, uh, there are a lot of people talk about AI, but they don't really focus on, on, the, on the, what's happening behind the scenes. And so let me tell you in a, in a really in a nutshell what, uh, how AI works, in, because you need to understand that in order to understand how it's moving so quickly. The second exponential. Uh, and that is that AI has sort of, there's two ways to build an AI system. One is rule-based and the other one is data-driven. So rule-based AI means that you, you get some expert that writes down rules and the computer can execute these rules very, very quickly. I'll give you an example. Let's say you wanted to build an AI system that would catch fraudulent transactions in a bank. Okay, how would you do that? You hire an expert. The expert tells you, here's a, here's a rule. If somebody spends in one day three times more they spent in the previous month, it's probably fraudulent transaction. So a computer can take that rule, run it on a gazillion transactions a second, flag all the suspicious ones, and bam, you have a system, right? It looks intelligent. Everybody likes it. Experts like it. Customers like it. Banks like it. Regulators like it. We all love rules. We like rules because we can understand them in concrete. We can explain it to each other. We love it. And I would say that 99% of AI systems today are built on rules because we like it. It's nice. The alternative is uh, data-driven AI. And the data-driven AI is you don't tell the computer what to do, you show it. You don't tell the computer, here are the, the, the rules for catching a fraudulent transaction. You show the computer and maybe a couple dozen examples of fraudulent transactions. The computer can look at these fraudulent transactions, uh, calculate its own sort of signatures, statistical signatures of what makes something fraudulent, and it can look for more of these things. So uh, we don't like it that very much because we're not sure how the computer does it. It's a little bit more opaque. But the value of this approach is that you don't need to understand what the rules are. You just need to give it examples. Now, rule-based AI requires an expert to come up with the rules. Now, experts, as we know, are slow, expensive, and frequently wrong. And in fact, if you want a rule-based AI system to improve, you're going to find a new expert. You're going to find more rules, and that's difficult. For many problems, sometimes trivial, we don't even know what the rules are. And I'll show you some examples in a moment. But for data-driven AI, all you need to do to improve the system is give it more data. And that is really, really important. Uh, and it is amazing that this simple idea works for almost everything. For example, that AI system that was driving a car that I talked about earlier is all data driven you just give it examples of how people drive in various situations and it learns and it learns and it knows what to do from all these examples so it's an incredibly powerful technology and it can be used for lots of different things but the important thing is data driven ai is fueled by data and data is plentiful and is also growing exponentially in fact data is growing exponentially at a far faster rate than is computing power. Data is growing exponentially at a rate, it's doubling every six months or so, the amount of data. So when you talk about exponentials, you always want to ask, okay, if it's an exponential, what is the doubling period? The doubling period of data is about six months. Uh, it's an incredibly fast pace. So when you look at data, you have to remember, we're not talking about things like uh, emails and web clicks and transactions. When we talk about data, we talk about things that are very, very difficult to capture. That it's, it's, uh, it's it, video, imagery, it's, it's what you radiate when you walk down the street. It's very, very difficult to even understand how much data we produce. It's all that camera footage. It's, it's your DNA that you leave when you touch something or when you breathe. All this, we emit data all the time and the a that data that we emit that information is fuel that is fueling the modern data driven ai all right so that was the second exponential that's going a lot faster than the first exponential the third exponential a little bit trickier to understand a little bit behind the scenes uh, and that is the way that ai is actually built the data driven ai and here's a little secret that up until a decade ago it turns out that 
even though we have a lot of data, a lot of machine learning, there's certain things that AI couldn't do. For example, not even the best and brightest AI systems out there, machine learning based AI systems could do something trivial like tell the difference between a cat and a dog. You'd give an AI an image of a pet and say, is it a cat or a dog? The AI could not reliably tell the difference between these two. And not for lack of data, not for lack of computing power, not for lack of machine learning algorithms. All of that was there, not for lack of talent. It was all there, and yet nobody could write any software that reliably tell the difference between these two. Now, you could say, who cares about cats and dogs? But what about, let's say, motorcycles and bicycles? No AI could tell the difference between these two. So that was uh, uh, about a decade ago. Situation was so bad, the AI community itself decides to, uh, to sort of outsource this, uh, this challenge to see if anybody around the planet can write software that would do this. They create this large competition where they release a million images of cats and dogs. A million images, not just cats and dogs, a couple other categories, but but a lot of cats and dogs, and they say, somebody write software that can tell the difference between these two. Uh, so I remember that big competition. It was a big competition. Everybody competed, uh, big companies, small companies, domestic, international, hackers, universities, big companies posing as small companies, small companies posing as big companies, you name it. Everybody was there. Uh, 2010 was the first competition. Uh, the, the deadline was, uh, was uh, September 30, midnight Pacific time. I remember that moment. We were watching the scoreboard, and the results come in. And at midnight, the turns out the best software on the planet, a decade ago, gets it right 75% of the time. 75%. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be sleeping in the back of a driverless car that gets it right 75% of the time. 75% of the time is good enough for, for winning the stock market. It's good enough for winning the you know, world championship in chess. But 75% is not good enough for driving a car. And that is the, the fallacy of intelligence. We think that intelligence is playing chess, uh, but actually telling the difference between a dog and a cat is a lot harder than playing chess. It's just that we're so good at it, we don't appreciate how difficult it is. So uh, it's because probably because we've been playing chess for thousands of years, but we've been telling the difference between cats and dogs for millions of years. 2011 comes along, competition is run again, September 30, midnight Pacific time. The results come in 75%. So, as we say in New York, Moore's Law, Moore's Law. It looks like there's something else we're missing that isn't, that is necessary, that we don't have in order to create this new AJI. 2012 comes along, competition is run again. September 30, midnight Pacific time comes along, results come in. 74%. It's worse. Why? Because they changed the cats and dogs a little bit. But then at midnight, the new software comes in. And suddenly the arrow goes down from, from 25% to 16%. I remember that moment. It's a watershed moment in the world of AI. What happened? New software from a group from Toronto, a university in Canada, uh, comes in and changes the way we do things. It's called uh, deep learning. Uh, and what they did is they open sourced it. Everybody watched and looked inside and turns out what they did is basically take the old-fashioned AI systems that we had for decades called neural networks but they stack them many many layers many layers deep an AI on top of another AI on top of another AI many many layers deep they found a way to get that to work uh, and they call it deep learning because it is stacked many many layers deep this is why it's called deep learning not because it's philosophically deep but because it's stacked many layers deep and that technology was able to, to tell the difference between a cat and a dog. An amazing accomplishment. Uh, everybody copies it. The next year, the error goes down even more uh, to, to, to 10%. The next year, it goes down to 5%. That's about the rate, the performance of a human. The uh, rate before the year after that, around 2017, it goes down to, to uh, around 3% error. So, so for the first time in history, machines are better than humans in understanding what they see. And that is just the beginning, because machines 
don't have to see the world in red, green, and blue like we do. They can see the world in a broad swath of the spectrum, and they can see things at night and things in the dark and see things in a higher frequency in, in colors we can't see and, and in frequencies we cannot hear. So this is the worst it's ever going to be. So the third reason why AI is moving forward is not just because we've transitioned to data-driven AI, because the deep, the depth of these AI systems, the, the capacity to learn is increasing exponentially as well. In fact, if you look at all these uh, AI systems and how deep they are, how many parameters they are, how much capacity to learn they have over the last couple of years, and you ask yourself, what is the doubling period of that technology? You'll see it doubles every three months. So you see Moore law, Moore's law, price performance of computers is doubling every 20 months. Data is doubling every six months and the capacity of AI to learn is doubling every three and a half months. That is an incredibly fast performance. It makes Moore's law look like a flat line compared to the way that AI is moving forward. Uh, and uh, I will end with the fourth exponential. And the fourth exponential is perhaps the deepest and most fascinating of them all, and that is the cloud. Now, the cloud is something that you've all heard about. You've you probably used the cloud, upload, download, offload. You already use the cloud in lots of different ways. But the cloud means something very different to AI. It means AI teaching other AI systems. AI teaching other AI. So I'll give you an example. If you have a driverless car that is learning to drive, uh, unlike a human that can have one lifetime of, of uh, driving experience, the driverless car can, can teach or can share its experience with all other driverless cars. So when one driverless car experiences something, that experience is immediately had or experienced by all other cars. In other words, the better the more driverless cars there are, the better each one of them gets. That's not true for humans. We don't become better drivers because there are more drivers on the road. In fact, we become a little bit, uh, we drive a little bit less well. Uh, your doctor doesn't become a better doctor because there are more doctors out there. But a car does. AI doctor does. An AI doctor that diagnoses cancer can diagnose it better if the copy of that AI exists in more and more places, it gets more and more experience, it learns to get better, gets and better and better. So when something like that is self-amplifying, you can smell there is an exponential in there. Every exponential is due at its core to some self-amplifying technology, and the cloud allows AI to teach AI, and that is at the core, at its core, a self-amplifying technology. And you ask me, what is the doubling period of the cloud of AI teaching AI, that frankly, nobody knows. It is very, very difficult to assess, but I have a feeling if you look at the rate in which AI systems learn, let's say, to drive, uh, it is growing faster even than, than the growth of a single AI system because of the self-amplifying effect. I suspect the doubling period is a lot faster. So, uh, so that's it for today. We have four exponential Moore's Law which used to be a huge exponential, but it's flat compared to the growth of data that is fueling AI. The size and capacity of the AIs to learn, which is also growing exponentially even faster, and then the cloud, which allows AI systems to teach other AI systems. So an incredibly powerful journey. And remember, AI worms its way into everything. It doesn't matter if you are studying journalism or you're a historian, or you're running a retail business, or you're running a manufacturing system, whatever it is you're doing, AI is going to worm its way into your business, into your market, into your discipline, and change it. And it's really important to understand what's driving it. All right, so this is as much time as we have today. Uh, I would love to talk to you more about the future. Everything I've said up until now is the past. It's already happened. Uh, but the, the big question is, what is going to happen next? I like to think about this in terms of waves. Uh, we're in the third wave out of about six waves of AI, and I'm happy to talk to you later about what those future waves of AI are going to be. Thank you.